Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who kind of likes the opera crowd. It makes him feel tough. Here is the captain. Asolamia. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week in the garage, we are very excited to be featuring Roaring Silence from the good people at Jackie O's in beautiful Athens, Ohio. Roaring Silence is a hazy double India pale ale featuring cashmere hops paired with Citra, Centennial, Cryo, and Sabro ABV, 9% garage grade, four and a half bottle caps. The brewers and workers over at Jackie O's are incredible and you know who else is good people it's our friends right here first up a big cheers to tracy and fargo north dakota do you know what roaring silence sounds like (laughs) there you go and a big shout out to julie and reynolds north dakota next up a shout to lisa g all the way in lincoping sweden and a big we like your jib to Catherine in lexington south carolina here's a big shout out to dr gonzo in roslindale massachusetts and last but certainly not least we have glenn and nicole in klemeth falls oregon everyone we just mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com and contributed to this week's beer fund and for that we thank you. Yeah, shout out to Gonzo. That makes me miss our Gonzo, Nick, and Emma from Australia. So cheers to them, mates. And some exciting news starting February 14th, our gift to you. You could be our Valentine's. All of our episodes will be available everywhere on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcast. You can find all of our episodes there starting February 14th. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. The last confirmed sighting of 12-year-old Tina Marie Harmon of record was at 6.30 p.m. on Thursday, October 29, 1981. Sources have Tina seen walking along Main Street in downtown Creston, Ohio. Five days later, her body was discovered in a remote location in Stark County, approximately 45 miles away. This was the first indication to the public that the demons had come out. Arrests were made, and two men were convicted, but mistakes were made, and the convictions were overturned. The men were set free, and Tina's killer was still hiding in the shadows. Less than one year later, on July 17, 1982, on a stormy Saturday afternoon, 11-year-old Krista Harrison was snatched up from a park across the street from her home. Reports state that two juveniles witnessed the abduction. Just six days later, in a decrepit old garage, her remains were spotted by turtle trappers as they marched through the fields of Holmes County. Significant physical evidence was located at the body disposal site. Detectives struggled to turn this evidence into solid leads. Were the two cases linked? Then, 65 days later, and just over 100 miles to the south, another child goes missing. Eight-year-old Kellyanne Prosser vanished from the bustling streets of the north side of the capital city of Columbus. She failed to return to her mother after leaving school to walk home that autumn afternoon in late September. Police searched the area high and low, but there was no sign of the little girl, no clue as to her whereabouts. Unfortunately, Kelly would soon be found, but the outcome was what everyone had feared. Her lifeless body was found in a peak height cornfield 10 rows back. The only obvious conclusion was that the spot that Kelly was found was far, far from where she was picked up. The spot seemed terribly random, or perhaps, as the detectives questioned, familiar to the killer. But without question, Kelly and Prosser's murder case was hauntingly familiar. 
Investigators in multiple counties were searching for a link, for a connection, for any clue at all, as unsolved child homicide case files stacked up on desks. None could deal with the level of this tragedy. No one could explain just what was happening. The community feared the worst, and the people wanted to know who was killing our girls. This is True Crime Garage. In 1982, Kelly Ann Prosser was eight years old. She was a very outgoing, happy, chatty little girl who loved to dance with her sister and go to the pool and make arts and crafts. She was in third grade at Indianola Elementary. Kelly's mother, Linda, worked at OSU, not far away. Linda recently got remarried to a man named Larry Garner. And according to Kelly's teacher, Barbara Cleveland, Kelly was excited about her new stepfather. Kelly's 11-year-old brother, Keith, was in middle school, and her sister, Christina, was 14 years old. On Monday, September 20th, this was just about two weeks into a new school year. In the previous school years, Kelly was accustomed to walking to school with her brother, but now he is in middle school, so he's going to a different school. Eight-year-old Kelly was insistent that she get to walk to school on her own. Her school was on East 16th Avenue, right on the edge of the OSU campus in the university district, surrounded by sorority houses and residences. This was not an isolated area that we hear so much about in these types of abduction cases. It was a densely populated, safe city neighborhood. Kelly and her mom, Linda, planned out the 15-block route that Kelly would take to and from school. Yeah, for the most part, the OSU campus is a safe place, but it's surrounded by areas that are high in crime rate. She would walk along High Street. This was a commercial area with storefronts. We have OSU students out and about and public businesses. On this Monday in late September, Kelly's teacher, Mrs. Cleveland, said that Kelly helped out by watering the plants in the classroom. She seemed totally normal and happy. At the end of the school day, she set out to walk home. A friend posted on WebSleuths that she was supposed to walk with Kelly that day, but she got delayed for some reason. Linda, her mother, said that there was no formal arrangement for Kelly to be accompanied by a friend. Friends just lived in the same area, and sometimes they liked to walk together. It is believed that Kelly took her normal route home that day because a shopkeeper near 18th Avenue says that she saw Kelly looking into her store window. This, according to the witness, was between 3.30 and 4 p.m., which is the approximate time that Kelly would have been walking by if she stuck to her normal route and timeline. The shopkeeper later related seeing a little girl in a blue raincoat and she did ID Kelly's photo for police. According to the Columbus Dispatch, Kelly was last seen at 3.30 p.m. walking westbound on East 16th Avenue near the corner of East 16th Avenue and North High Street by her third-grade classmates. Kelly also was seen at the intersection of Lane Avenue and North High Street walking home that day. Tough thing about this area is there's so many residents there And a lot of the students live in old houses. So what do old houses need? They need maintenance. So you have maintenance workers going in in and out of this area all day long. You have deliveries being made to all these businesses all day long. So there could be anywhere from 50,000 to 100,000 individuals that go into this area and go out of this area Daily. On this day, Kelly's mom, Linda, happened to have a dentist appointment after work. So Kelly was supposed to walk home and should arrive there around 4 p.m. Her sister, Christina, and her new dad, Larry, would be home at this time. Now, due to some kind of miscommunication, Christina and Larry assumed that Linda, the mother, was picking up Kelly and taking her with her to the dentist appointment. So Kelly never made it home at 4 p.m., but 
this didn't raise any red flags immediately because of this miscommunication. Right. So when Linda gets home after the appointment, she's wondering where Kelly is. She thought she was going to be home. The people at home thought they would be, she would be at the dentist appointment. Now we have a problem. She never came home that day. Right. So the family jumped in the car. They went to the school and then they drove around following Kelly's route. There was no sign of her. Linda spotted a Columbus PD patrol wagon and flagged it down. And the officers then and there took a report and they started looking for Kelly. The police officers told Linda, you should go home and call 911 to report the, a missing juvenile. So by 6.02 p.m., Kelly's description was transmitted over the police wire, and it was noted that officers were already looking for her per Linda talking to the patrol vehicle. Right. Linda called all of Kelly's school friends, her teacher, and other family members looking for her daughter, but Kelly was nowhere to be found. Well, not only would Columbus PD be looking for her, but I'm sure they would contact security at Ohio State to let them know what was going on. By 9 a.m. the next day, the local news was covering the case. They reported that the child was last seen leaving school wearing a blue raincoat, jeans, and a white and pink flowered blouse. Police taking this disappearance seriously from the get-go. They set up a command post, conducted area searches, scoured the river. They tracked down and questioned Kelly's biological father, They interviewed neighbors, friends, classmates, and acquaintances. But there was no sign of Kelly. It was as if she had simply vanished into thin air. Once the news broadcast the story of the missing 8-year-old, tips began to flood in. At 8.30 on Tuesday night, the 21st, a call came in from Lisa Richmond of Plain City. This is a 30-minute drive away from where Kelly was last seen. She said that her father, an attorney named Charles Richmond, was driving to pick up the family's housekeeper on A.W. Wilson Road. This is out in the sticks in Madison County. Charles noted a blue piece of clothing in the road. It was still there on his return journey with the housekeeper, Clara, in the vehicle. They stopped to pick up the little blue piece of outerwear. After searching, this was turned out to be a raincoat. After searching the raincoat for identification, they only found a metal bolt in one of the pockets, no name or nothing. So they put it on the floor of the vehicle and kind of just forgot about it. When Lisa and her mother went to drive the housekeeper home at the end of the day, Lisa saw the raincoat. Clara decided to bring it home with her so that she could give it to maybe a niece or somebody else could use this. They dropped her off with the coat and started on the return journey home. Now on the way home, captain, Mrs. Richmond told Lisa the story that she had heard on the news about the missing little girl from Columbus, Ohio. Lisa's interest was piqued and she found a newspaper article about Kelly, about the case. And there in the description of the little girl's attire was the blue raincoat. Lisa sensed strongly that the little blue raincoat that they found on the country road may have belonged to the missing child. So she called police and the cops followed her and her father to the housekeeper's house to get the coat. And then Charles and Clara showed the investigators where they found the raincoat. A lot of the listeners would be familiar with the case or the disappearance of Brian Schaefer. This is only probably a mile away from where Brian went missing. Now, per the Columbus dispatch, a Columbus police homicide sergeant stated that there appeared to be a couple of smears of blood on the sleeve of the little blue raincoat. The Richmonds did not notice this blood until it was pointed out by police officers. Mm. Officers dedicated to Kelly's case brought the raincoat to Linda She identified it as Kelly's and told them that her daughter was wearing it on the day that she went missing. Linda says that this was when she knew her daughter was not coming home. Yeah. Knowing that the raincoat was a sign that they were close to Kelly, officers started combing the area where the raincoat was found. 
This, again, is a rural area, with A.W. Wilson Road running between cornfields and the crops looming high. By the time searches commenced, it was dark, and police called it at 2 a.m. on the 22nd because it was just too dark. It's the middle of the night. They resumed the next morning, this with dogs, a helicopter, and foot patrols running grid searches. At 1.09 p.m., Ohio State Patrol Trooper Bryant found a child's body several rows back in a cornfield abutting A.W. Wilson Road. According to the dispatch, the Madison County Sheriff said that Kelly was fully clothed with her shoes, socks, pants, and underwear on. There were no obvious signs of gunshot wounds or knife wounds, and investigators were not sure how long she had been there. There were no notable footprints around the body or in the cornfield. The sheriff said that tire tracks in a neighboring field appeared to be related to farm work, not from a potential suspect vehicle. The spot where Kelly was found was very far away from where she was picked up. I mean, she's eight years old. This is a 30-minute drive or so. There's no way for her to get there on her own. Right. This location is also quite a distance from the closest highway exit. So this is a remote country road. Now, this road, Captain, is straight enough, and we've seen this in some other cases. This is a straight, long road. That at night, you could see cars coming for miles from their headlights. Right. Someone took the time to drive all the way out there and hide Kelly in the cornfield 10 rows back so that she was not visible from the road. Well, a couple things there. I, I would assume that this individual had to know the area a little bit because then they would know that this rural road is going to give them the opportunity and also, because the road gave them the opportunity, they were able to go further back. We've seen many cases where they dump the victim right on the, the side of the road for anybody to see. This this suspect is trying to cover up the body in some manner. Yeah, putting it several rows back from the street so that it's not easily spotted, not spotted right away. The killer wanted some time before... The killer wanted some time to expire before the body was found. And when police notified Kelly's family of her death, Kelly's sister, Christina, had to be restrained as she ran screaming from their home. Well, also, this suspect would have to know a lot about the area in which she was picked up in. It's it's actually a very interesting location because Lane and High, if they believe that's where roughly where she got picked up at, or I would question what was her route because if she was staying on, on high street, obviously that's heavily populated. You could go down further on lane and jump on Indianola or Indiana Avenue, and that would take you back ways. And so I wonder if she got to one of those back roads. But again, what's interesting here is if you head west, north or south, there's going to be Uh, opportunities to hit the freeway and and not that far. You're not miles from hitting the freeway in any direction. Kelly's mother, Linda, identified the body as that of her daughter, Kelly Ann Prosser. There was evidence that the victim was sexually assaulted. The coroner ruled the cause of death as lack of oxygen to the brain caused by strangulation. Marks around Kelly's neck indicated a rope or piece of fabric was used to strangle her. There was some indication that she had been beaten on the head, and of course the case was officially ruled a homicide. Columbus PD would remain in charge of the case. Now, per an October 13, 1982 Columbus Dispatch article, Columbus police announced that the FBI did not find any fingerprints that would help to identify Kelly's killer. As quoted from the article, police said clothing from Kelly's body and clothing seized from a north side man suspected in her murder were sent to the FBI crime lab. Police were looking for Kelly's fingerprints on the suspect's clothing and the suspect's fingerprints on Kelly's clothing. The FBI used a laser device to try to find fingerprints from both sets of clothes. 
Columbus police were told by the FBI that they found no prints on the articles of clothing that were seized during the investigation. The tests on Kelly's clothes were inconclusive, and the FBI didn't find anything of value. Police also said that there was no evidence indicating whether the killer wore gloves. Regardless, what we see here is a very important word in that statement. Suspect. They already had a suspect very early on in their investigation. They're looking for his prints specifically on anything related to Kelly and at the dump site. They're looking for her fingerprints on on his clothing that it was believed that he would have been wearing the day that she went missing. Or possibly they have a if they have a potential suspect, the suspect has a vehicle, I'm sure they can impound the vehicle and look for fingerprints there as well. So if we don't have a situation, we don't have a situation where anybody saw this girl get abducted. And that's where we're kind of left with this mystery. We have the last sighting of her. Okay. It's at this location. We know that she probably was picked up or abducted somewhere between that location and her home. That's as best as we can come up with because there's no other witnesses that spotted her at any other point. There's nobody coming forward saying, I saw a little girl screaming as she was pulled into a vehicle. Right. But that's where I was saying her last known whereabouts were laying in high. Well, that's heavily populated, but it's coming towards the end of the Ohio State campus. It's coming towards the end of the the most heavily populated area of her travels. So the most sense to me based off of where she lives is that she'd be heading I, I believe it'd be heading east on Lane and then she'd go north on Indianola. But once you get to Indianola, we're talking about, you know, one tenth the people, you know, maybe one twentieth of the people. I mean there it's such a less populated road compared to high street. But if the killer's cunning enough, it doesn't have to take place where nobody saw or nobody could see anything. Right. I mean, he simply could have asked her to get in his vehicle and she did. Well, and you also wonder her being an eight year old corner, corner of lane and high at that time would have been at least a gas station or a convenience store. Did he have some ruse to get her in the car at the at the gas station? You know, I again, I would guess that she went to a less heavily populated area, and that's where he made his move. We're back. Cheers, mates. Cheers to everybody out there. Let's talk about this suspect because very early on in this investigation, they are already talking about a suspect. Why do we have a suspect when we don't have any witnesses that say that they saw this man with Kelly? So this viable suspect was immediately identified and tips were pouring in about this guy. Early on in the investigation, this was because this suspect had sexually assaulted an 11 year old girl on Sunday, September 19th. This is one day before Kelly was taken. Wow. So this assault, it's, it's been described as a molestation, as a sexual assault. This was the day before she was taken, before Kelly was taken. This took place in the Park of Roses on the north side of Columbus. So in the area, the immediate area, the victim was in the park on a picnic with the offender and with his grandchildren. And consequently, there was a warrant out for the arrest of, this is the suspect, Walter Mitchell Jr., age 63, and the charges were of gross sexual imposition for this attack. So he's a creepy old dirtbag. Walter conveniently left for West Virginia, and the cops were yet to catch up to him. So 
there are even more reasons than just that to think that old Walter might have killed Kelly other than just proximity and time and location of the two cases in their search in law enforcement search for the little girl officers took canines out to canvas Kelly's neighborhood. This obviously before they found her body shortly after she goes missing, we want to see if we can retrace her steps to see where she may have been picked up or where she went. You're still hoping for the best when she's still missing. So they take the canines out to canvas Kelly's neighborhood and the dogs, they went right to Mitchell's home. They're alerting them on Mitchell's home. Right. According to the fifth floor, the dogs even tried to get into the back gate of his house. From my understanding, Captain, this is information that came out years later. The police obviously knew this information, but it was nothing that they released to the share this with the public. They didn't share it with the public. I think in part because one, they had a good suspect, they believed. And two, you don't want somebody in the public doing something to this guy. You have to figure out if, in fact, he is actually guilty of Kelly's abduction and murder. Yeah, you don't want to have a scene where they go out into the streets and try to take him down like Frankenstein. So, but they have this individual said he's 63, 63 years old. They have canines hitting on this unit, and this is from her scent. This, these, these aren't cadaver dogs. No, they're trying to retrace her steps. They're trying to figure out, you know, she's just missing when they're when they're doing this canine search of her neighborhood. So you're hoping it's a little kid. Maybe she got lost. Maybe she crawled into something. Maybe she got injured and couldn't finish the the walk home. You're hoping for all of those kind of things while you're searching for this girl. These dogs, they go straight to this dude's home. They try to get into his back gate. And at the same time, police are very quickly going, well, uh, who lives here? Oh, this guy that we have a warrant out for his arrest for molesting a girl the day before Kelly went missing. Yeah. We still got to pick up this dude. We're still looking for this creep. Then a report came in from two police officers that said that they had seen a man matching the suspect's description, Mitchell's description, holding hands with a little girl who the officers said looked like Kelly. This was near North High Street on Monday night. These officers even picked Mitchell out of a photo lineup. And police believe that the girl who was an alleged victim of Walter Mitchell the day before, that she was, in fact, a friend of Kelly's. So everything's getting to be really tied together right now. Yeah, there's a connection there. So this is just too big of a coincidence, right? A child molester who lived near Kelly, preyed on one of her friends the day before, now Kelly vanishes she's found murdered and the dogs track kelly near this man's home well and the connection really is like you said this guy has grandkids so you're assuming that these grandkids are similar age and and that's kind of his gateway in if you were walking and you saw your your friend's parents or your friend's grandparents and they said hey uh, let me uh, let me help you get home you're more inclined to go okay I know who you are. You're, you're so-and-so's grandpa. Investigators were pretty confident that Mitchell knew all about what had happened to Kelly Prosser. So they go to speak to Mitchell's wife and what she had to say or didn't have to say, convinced them even further that this in fact was their guy. Let's just hold up a second. So this, this old dirtbag creep douche pilot, he's married. Mm-hmm. This, okay. The, uh, all the good ones are, right? When they interview his wife, this is when they learn that Mitchell apparently left for West Virginia. He had family there, and quite suddenly he had to leave for West Virginia all of a sudden because he says to her that there was an illness in his family. But yeah. his wife... Yeah, it's called molesting kids. She tells police, you know, I'm not sure who was sick or even exactly where the husband was. You know, she's not saying he went to this person's house in this city 
in West Virginia. She's saying he went to West Virginia, and that's about all that I know. So the cops determined that Mitchell was at work on Monday. This is the day that Kelly was taken, and Mitchell was there, or they could place him at his work at least until 3.25 p.m. He left work early. This is agitated after getting two phone calls. And he did not show up for work the next day. So (laughs) this is really looking like they've found the right guy here. The timeline fits. But hold on. But barely is what we need to point out here. Okay, so we know that he goes to work, but we know that we know that he sexually assaulted a victim on Sunday. Mm -hmm. So the calls that he's getting are probably somebody letting him know that he's going to be charged with this crime is what I'm guessing, right? Or police saying that they wanted to question him. I don't know what these calls were exactly, but if you want to lay out a very brief timeline for this Mitchell character, it's allegedly he assaults this girl in the park on Sunday, goes to work on Monday. He receives two calls, two phone calls, and whatever these calls are, they're enough to make him visibly upset to his coworkers who say, Hey, he left a little early cause he was angry about something. Right. He left at three twenty five, and then his wife is saying, okay, well he, uh, not only did he leave work a little early that day, he didn't go into work the next day. He also all of a sudden had to go out to West Virginia because there's an illness in his family. Right. So this looks really, really bad for Mitchell. To the cops, this guy was prime suspect number one. Mm -hmm. The one thing I do want to point out here, though, you know, we do have some time that goes by before Kelly's body is found. And so it's not impossible, but just for people trying to picture what's going on, Columbus is in in the center of Ohio. And if he were heading to West Virginia, he would actually be heading east. And her body was found west of Columbus, opposite direction of where he said he would be going. Right, but we don't have to believe everything he says. Mitchell's daughter told the police that her father had been with her until about 5.30 p.m. on the day that Kelly vanished. And again, we know that Mitchell left work at 3.25. Kelly was last seen between 3.30 and 4 p.m., So he's got an alibi. It's just a a pretty weak one, if you ask me. Right. Police got a search warrant for Mitchell's home and for his vehicle. They found no evidence of Kelly having been at either the home or in the vehicle at any time. Mitchell returned to Columbus. This was on Thursday. And when he returned to Columbus, he turned himself in to police. He told police that his wife called him at work on Monday to tell him that a card was left by police on their door saying they wanted to talk to him about the complaint from the day before. Right. Now we know what at least one of the calls were, and it was related to police activity and to his activity the day before. Uh, This said that, of course, they wanted to speak with him about the girl accusing him of molesting her. So in the light of this news, Mitchell, I guess, decides to leave town. He told his wife that due to prior arrest, he could not be caught with a juvenile. So he went to West Virginia, and he says he was going to just kind of wait it out. Mitchell told the cops that he never touched the 11-year-old girl in the picnic, or I'm sorry, at the picnic in the park. And he went on to tell investigators that he had never seen Kelly Ann Prosser before. He didn't know who she was. Never knew who she was until she was missing and seeing her picture in the paper and being told he's a suspect in the case. Right. Detectives, of course, looked hard at Mitchell. His attorney, William Abram, swore up and down that his client was innocent. He told the Columbus Citizen Journal that, quote, I can and I will verify beyond a shadow of a doubt that my client was nowhere near Columbus When the terrible incident occurred, I can say this is one of the few times in my career that I have a man as a client who is totally innocent, end quote. 
Well, again, you have an eight-year-old girl g- going missing, so the first person that you put on your radar, if your police are, are known sex offenders in that area, but you, you're not saying that he was a known sex offender, but he did have this claim against him the day before. Correct. But we also have the dogs going to his house. I mean, there's there's right. good reason to look at this guy, and then he magically decides to go to West Virginia. So uh, he, he looks guilty. Yeah. As investigators looked into Mitchell more and more, though, their case against him started to fall apart. While his supervisor confirmed that he left work, left his job that day at 3.25 p.m., his wife said that she was with him from the time that he returned home from work until he dropped her off at J.C. Penny Catalog Distribution Center on Scarborough Boulevard and I-70 on the far east side of Columbus. So yeah. this this makes a little more sense here because what she is telling police is he came home. He came directly home. I was with him until I had to go to work. He drove me to my work, dropped me off. We're assuming, I'm assuming that's in his vehicle. Yeah. I, I, I'm assuming that they may only have one vehicle right. between the two of them. Now, he's going to drive east. He has to drive her. This is far east from Columbus. Right to her work. So this makes sense that he would drop her off at her work and he's practically on interstate 70 at this point. He would just continue on, keep going east and go straight to West Virginia. Yeah. He's a good 30, 40 minutes into that trip. So, I mean, so now police are looking at it. Okay. We have this guy kind of lines up that he could be somebody that would be involved. We have the dogs going to his house, but now we have his wife, which she could be a scumbag too, but you got to be a whole nother level of scumbag to cover up a, a child's murder. And we have no evidence of her seeing the victim. We have no evidence. She doesn't see any child alive or dead. And like you said, where she's located, where the victim's located is 30, 40 minutes from that spot. But from where he's taking his wife, it's an hour or so away. Yeah, from the dump site to where her work would be. Right. Yeah, and so what we have here, Captain, is you nailed it. Because if this dude did this, if Mitchell is guilty of the abduction and murder, then it seems like when you put all these pieces together, that that means that his wife had to have been involved in some form or fashion. Because his window of opportunity or time that he's available to commit any part of this crime it gets very small and you can really, I mean, there's no getting around it. You, you know what time he left work. You have credible witnesses telling you he left at three 25. Now you have a whole bunch of people The JC penny catalog distribution center. That's a big place of business back then. There had to have been a ton of employees working you have her arriving at work roughly around 5.30 p.m. that night. So you got a bunch of credible witnesses stating that. There's no way getting around that. That leaves for a very small window of time. Now you go, okay, well, what about his whereabouts and is he accounted for after he drops off his wife? Because then he has for the entirety of her shift. In fact, he doesn't come back to Columbus until Thursday. So you have to question his whereabouts then, but... This is this is why we see the case against this guy starting to fall apart because the timeline it, it just doesn't track. It doesn't trace that that he had a lot of availability to do any of this because Mitchell made a collect call to his wife who was at home right about 7:41 p.m. on that night. So this is an easily trackable call you can verify if this call came in or not because it was called collect. Right. You know, somebody's got to pay this bill. Uh, so that call came in from Mineral Wells, West Virginia. So, yeah, you know, the phone rings, ring, 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 and you pick up and it says, you have a collect call from the prick sniffer. Do you accept the collect call? And then you say yes, and then and that's how we have the evidence that he was Or at least somebody from that area called her. But they also normally have you 
state your name, or they used to. So you'd say, uh, you have a collect call from the captain, or it would be my voice saying the captain. He also, Mitchell said that he also made calls from Charleston, West Virginia later that same evening. So police were able to find people who saw Walter Mitchell in West Virginia on that Monday evening. These calls are starting to make it look like he was where he says he was. And we have witnesses saying that they saw him in these locations in West Virginia as well. Further, Mitchell, potential Mitchell siding with Kelly, siding by the two police officers, this was proven to be mistaken identity. It was learned that the man that police saw was not Mitchell and the girl that police saw was not Kelly. It wasn't Kelly with some other guy. It was neither Mitchell nor Kelly that was seen by the uh, police witnesses. What we have here is a guy came forward and said, I think that police saw me. And that makes sense because I was in the area with my daughter at that time. Right. And then police look at the daughter and this guy and they're like, oh yeah, that those are the people that we, we saw. But two things about this case so far. One, the pressure you would feel being this guy's em- employer, right? And so when, when the cops come to talk to you, it's like you want to help them, but obviously you want to tell them the truth. But you're also thinking in the back of your head, man, if this guy did this, this guy's an animal, right? Mm-hmm. And he needs to be locked up. But you, you don't want to falsify anything, right? And then on the on the side of the police, you have this girl going missing eight years. She's eight years old. Not only is her, her parents probably freaking out, but the whole community, because in that area, there's a lot of elementary schools and and a lot of them walk to school and they're walking in crowds of young adults, 18 to 24 years old. And so the whole community then goes, oh, this sucks. And there's a whole community that is fearful now. But as the police officers, you're going, hey, we're doing some legwork. And every step of the way, we're getting confirmation that we're looking at the right guy. Well, I I think you are initially. but, But as your investigation continues on, you're getting confirmation that you're not looking at the right guy. No, but what I'm saying is the first few steps, you go, oh, we're on the right track. And then once you you know, hit that 10th step, you're going, okay, wait a second. This is now not lining up. And just to, to be processing that as a, as a law enforcement officer, that, that would be really frustrating because you would go from this high of, we're going to catch this bastard to this isn't the right bastard. Well, and what you have too, captain is this crime is so similar to the other crimes that we've already discussed. We have an abduction of a of a young girl. In this case, we're talking eight-year-old Kellyanne Prosser. Right. The two cases we previously discussed is that of 11 and 12-year-old girls. Now, mind you, this is 100 miles to the south of where the first two abductions and murders took place, but you have similar victimology. You have similar set of circumstances where it appears that the child was abducted off the streets. The body is not found for a few days later, and the body is found a considerable distance away from where the little girl was last seen. Yeah. So that's similar in all three of these cases. The only thing that's different in this case is that they immediately had a suspect, somebody that they were looking at. Of course, as we discussed, the, the case against him starts to fall apart, But in review of Mitchell's criminal record, he did have some convictions. He had a convict. He was convicted of breaking and entering, but this was 30 years earlier. Remember, this is a 63 year old man that we're talking about at the time. He did have five intoxication related arrests, but in his defense, he had zero violent crimes on his record and as we stated with the searches of his vehicle and his home and his clothing, there was simply no tangible evidence, no physical evidence linking Mitchell to the abduction and murder. Well, no other claims against him. 
as far as uh, child molestation or, or sexual assault. Uh, Mitchell was eventually found guilty of the molestation charges, and for that he received a sentence of 10 years. Again, back to being in law enforcement's shoes, yes, this crime is happening a hundred and some miles away, but we have an individual that just fled to another state. Mm-hmm. So, that, so that gives you more probable cause to go, oh, we're looking at the right individual because if these crimes are connected, we have a traveler. Yes. And, and like you said, a hundred miles, that, that ain't no joke. You know, uh, I used to have to travel every weekend for my job. I know you've done a lot of traveling for your past jobs. A hundred and some miles is, is no joke. Well, but the thing is here, we have a situation where in the first two cases, we're talking about, well, heck in the second case alone, 45 to 50 miles between abduction site and the body disposal site. Yeah. So like you pointed out, we have a traveler and there is reason to believe that there's a potential for these cases to be linked. One, because of victimology is the same circumstances are very similar and these crimes in themselves are rare crimes. Yeah. And it just so happens that we have three of them that take place in a short amount of time in roughly the same area. Now, given that's the state of Ohio, the top half of the state of Ohio, but when you compare how rare these crimes are, it's not that far fetched to think that, we have a traveler. We have a serial offender here that's hunting and, and abducting girls off of the street and killing them. Yeah. And like you said, wherever he picks them up at, that you're going to find them a distance away. It's, um, as, again, as far as where where are the heads of the detectives, you're, you almost uh, hope that they're not connected. You know what I mean? Um because this this individual becomes way more dangerous and maybe harder to track down. Well, that's true. I mean, you hope that they're not connected, but then at, at the same time, you're left going, okay, what's scarier? We have a serial child killer or we have hunting two. the area, or we have three child killers right. that are out there on the loose, undetected. For everything true crime, check out truecrimegarage.com while you're there. Sign up on the mailing list. The ones that have signed up on the mailing list, you guys got a promo code last night. So check your inboxes. And until tomorrow, be good, be kind, and don't litter.